Right on it. I want to read you some verses, selected verses from Ecclesiastes chapters 1 and 2. Maybe you can identify with, uh, with some of the things that Solomon has to say in this passage. Yeah. Meaningless. Meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. I, the teacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. So I hated life. Because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they have control over all the fruit of my toil, into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This, too, is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill. And then they must leave all they own to another who is not toiling for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days... Their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This, too, is meaningless. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This, too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without Him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases Him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, He gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What a passage! Does it kind of shock you that that's in the Bible? Let me ask you a question. What gets you up in the morning? Now, some of you say, the alarm clock. <laughs> that's not exactly what I meant. Some of you say, my mother. <laughs> I heard about uh, one fellow who was having trouble getting out of bed. And his mother said, it's time to get up. You have to go to school. She said, I don't want to get up. She waited a little while. She said, you've got to get up now. It's time for you to get ready for school. He said, I don't want to go to school. She said, you've got to go to school. He said, why do I have to go to school? She said, I'll give you three reasons. Number one, it's the right thing to do. Number two, people are counting on you. And number three, you're the principal. <laughs> well, sometimes people have trouble getting up in the morning. Seriously, what gets you going each day? If you don't have a sense of meaning and purpose in your life, it's difficult to get started. A life without meaning and purpose is a life of desperation and drudgery. And that's all too common in our society. Thoreau wrote, the masses of men live lives of quiet desperation. You know, even the great King Solomon struggled with a sense of meaninglessness in his life. And he wrote about it in this book called Ecclesiastes. The book is a part of the Bible. 
God included it in inspired scripture to warn us against searching for meaning in life in the wrong places. Meaningless, meaningless, he writes in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 2. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Now Solomon was in a unique position to try everything that this world has to offer. As the king of the nation of Israel, at the height of its wealth and power, he seemingly had it all. And yet, it came up short. He wrote that wisdom is meaningless. In verses 12 to 14, I was king over Israel, I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Now Solomon was reputedly the wisest man that ever lived. He was the recipient of divine wisdom. He was famous for his insights. He wrote the book of Proverbs, which is full of great practical advice. Sadly, he didn't follow his own advice <laughs> sometimes. But he was a wise individual in terms of his insights, in terms of his judgments, the way that he ruled. But he still had that feeling of meaninglessness. He wrote that wisdom is meaningless. And then he wrote that pleasure is meaningless. According to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, he says, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. My mind was still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. Many people live by the mantra, if it feels good, do it. They pursue pleasure. And there is pleasure in sin for a time. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. It's short term. But sin and the pleasures that it gives, it takes more and more and more for less and less and less pleasure until at the last there is no pleasure and people are slaves to their addictions. So, wisdom, he says, is meaningless. Pleasure is meaningless. How about work? Sadly, Solomon includes that work, too, is meaningless. In verse 17, So I hated life, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things that I had toiled for under the sun. Now work, it may be a four-letter word, but it's actually not a dirty word. I was in a public washroom one time and somebody had written work on the wall. No. <laughs> but picture the workaholic. The person who thinks that they're going to find meaning in life by working, working, working all the time, to the exclusion of family, to the exclusion of relationship, push, push, push. It's never enough. Work is never enough to satisfy the heart's restless passion. Never enough to give ultimate meaning. But what about advancement in your career? If you could just get ahead, if you could just get that promotion, if you could just get that raise, then things would be better. Then you have meaning and purpose. You know, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, tells the story of a youth who was born in poverty, spent time in prison as a young man, but who attracted a following and ultimately became the ruler of his entire nation. He displaced his predecessor. But... Those who came later were not pleased with him either. 
and he fell into disfavor. Some think if I could only get to the next level, if I could only be the boss, if I could be the company owner, I mean, then things would be good. I'd really be on easy street. I'd be fulfilled. People struggle to climb the ladder of success. And they think that that will give satisfaction. But that also comes up short. You know, somebody has said that there are no hard and fast rules for becoming successful. Only hard ones. <laughs> and riches. What about wealth? Maybe that would do it. You know, uh, Mark Twain said, I've been rich and I've been poor. Rich is better. Uh, most of us, given the choice, would prefer to be wealthy rather than poor. But is that going to be something that actually satisfies our heart's restless passion? According to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, beginning with verse 10, it says, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This, too, is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. Isn't that interesting? You know, I know people when the stock market drops a few points, they go into an absolute panic. You know what? Doesn't bother me a bit. <laughs> it says, I've seen a grievous evil under the sun, well hoarded to the harm of its owners, or well lost through some misfortune. So that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This, too, is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Wow! Somebody who had amassed a good deal of this world's wealth passed away. Somebody said, well, how much did they leave? And the response was, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> we read about the man who came to Jesus and complained. He said, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. And Jesus says, basically, that's not my role. And what does he do? He goes on to warn him against greed. How many families have been torn apart by fights over the inheritance? So sad, right? And then Jesus told the parable of the rich fool. The rich fool who, who said, I've got plenty. Man, I have got it made. I'm going to build bigger barns, I'm going to lay up all my goods, I'm going to take it easy, I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. And God says, you, tonight you're going to die. And then what's going to happen to all that stuff? What's going to happen to all your stuff? You can't get meaning from wealth. You can't get meaning from an abundance of possessions. Jesus said a man's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Greed, Jesus says, is idolatry. In other words, when you get greedy, you're worshiping money and the things that it can buy. And that is just placing the place that God should have in your life. So, wisdom, pleasure, work, advancement, riches, these are not bad things. In fact, they may even be desirable, but they are not enough give meaning to your life. They do not give you ultimate purpose. None of these things can ever really satisfy your heart's restless passion. A sense of meaninglessness leads so often to one of three things. Meaninglessness, a feeling of meaninglessness, leads to depression, 
aggression or addiction. I want you to stop and think about that. A lack of meaning and purpose in your life will lead to depression, aggression, or addiction. And sometimes, for those who give up, to suicide. So where do we turn? We turn to God. He alone can satisfy the deepest longings of the human heart. The great saint Augustine said, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. In the search for meaning, there is only one alternative that makes sense. Turn to God. Turn your life over to the God who loves you. Through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. God loves you. And He wants the best for you. That doesn't mean that He necessarily wants you to have well or the things that this world considers to be signs of success. God wants what's ultimately best for you. The fact is, though, that although God loves you, sin separates all of us from God so that we do not experience His love the way that He wants us to. Jesus Christ, God's Son, died for you. He paid the penalty on the cross for the death that you could not pay. When Jesus died and shed His blood, that was not the end. That was just the beginning. Jesus came back to life again. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a promise. God's promise and guarantee of new life for you too if you place your faith in Him. Faith, as the Bible uses the term, is really made up of two things. Belief and trust. It's believing in Jesus and it's trusting Him completely regardless. When Jesus Christ is at the center of your life, He is the one who gives meaning and purpose. He alone can satisfy the restless heart of every woman and man. He gives meaning to all of life. In fact, when Jesus is at the center of your life, those things that Solomon thought were meaningless become meaningful. Wisdom. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where it starts, with an awareness of God, a sense of awe at who He really is, and a sense of accountability to Him. Pleasure. Some people have the idea that God is against pleasure. That's not true. God's for pleasure, but the right kind of pleasure. Pleasure from those things that are good, not from those things that are wrong. Well, the pleasure of sin is only for a short time. The Bible says that at God's right hand, there is pleasure forevermore. Eternal pleasure. What about work? The Bible tells us that we are to work heartily as for the Lord and not for man. It says whatever you find to do, do it with all your might. You say, well, my job is humdrum. I just put in time until I can go home at the end of the day to watch a little TV and fall into bed. Now, understand, if you are a believer, you are doing your work for Jesus. If you understand that Jesus is the boss you're working for, it makes a huge difference in the way you do your work. You want to give it your very best for Him. What about advancement? You know, I found a passage in, in Corinthians. I think we'll take time to, to read it this morning. It's, it's quite interesting, really, when you stop and, and analyze what it's saying. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and beginning with verse 26, it says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. 
That is, when you were called to be believers in Jesus. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. You know, we weren't. We weren't those things. We weren't wise and influential and noble. Then it goes on to say, but God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. <coughs> because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. You talk about advancement. We were really nothing until Jesus found us. And he made us children of God. A kingdom of priests, the Bible says. Ambassadors of the king. That's meaningful advancement. And what about wealth and riches? The Bible does not teach that it's wrong to have money, even a great deal of money. But it does teach that it's wrong to love money. It does teach us that a love for money is the root of all kinds of evil. If God blesses you with an abundance of earthly things, I like the, the phrase that was coined by Francis Schaeffer. God calls you to the compassionate use of your accumulated wealth. In other words, it's not just so that you can live high on the high. It's so that you can bless others. Everyone should use whatever money they have according to the principles of God's word. I believe that every one of us should tithe our income. You say, well, I don't have enough money to give generously to God's work. If you don't use what you've got according to God's instructions, why would you expect Him to give you more? Let's do right by the things that God has given us. At the same time, let us also realize that riches most often do not come in the form of money or the things that can buy. I believe my son Eric was four years old when he came to me one day and he said, Dad, there are things that are worth more than money. And I looked at him and I said, Eric, that is right. That's true. There are things worth more than money. Do you know anything that's worth more than money? And that little boy said to me, love is worth more than money. I said, that's right. And then he said, friends are worth more than money. Man, where'd this kid get so smart? Out of the mouth of babes. There are things that are worth more than money. God, in his infinite plan, blesses us with a measure of wisdom, pleasure, work, advancement, and wealth, according to his will. God is good. God is a good Father. He blesses us, not because we are good, but because He is good. He blesses us, not because we are good, but because we are His. But what if you lose everything in this world? Like Job. Remember Job, that Old Testament character? He had it all going for him. Great family, wealth, and then everything went wrong. He didn't know why. All of his wealth was lost. All of his children were killed. His health was shot. Even his wife turned against him. And you would think that at that point, he would certainly want to give up. He would just say, 
what's the use? It's all meaningless. You know, I took a look at what Job had to say. Job chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, it says this. Job is talking. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Now if you've just gone through what Job went through, I wonder, would you or I say, may the name of the Lord be praised. In fact, the Bible goes on to say, in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. E. Stanley Jones, missionary to India, wrote these words. If you lose everything except Jesus, you discover that Jesus is enough. Paul, the apostle, wrote, Christ is all and is in all. Colossians 3 and 11. Common sense says, I need to strive for wisdom, for pleasure, for wealth, and success. That's common sense, but that's the natural man speaking. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. The Bible says, put God first in everything you do, and he will bless you and crown your efforts with success. You know, the greatest thing that God will ever give you is a relationship with himself. A relationship with God that is real and personal is the only thing that will satisfy your heart's restless passion and give your life real meaning and purpose. Right now, I want to invite you to pray with me. If your life has not been filled with meaning and purpose, if you are not sure what it's all about, this morning, turn your life over to God. Thank Him for loving you. Admit that you have sinned and been separated from Him. Thank him that Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sin. Ask him to take control of your life. To send his Holy Spirit into your life. To make you new. To help you to love him in return. Let God know that you want to be a Jesus follower. That you want to live for him within the fellowship of his church. And you will find a meaning and purpose. And you will find that the passion of your heart is satisfied in Jesus. Father God, this is the prayer of our hearts you know our hearts. You know. You know us intimately. You created us in the first place. And you've redeemed us. In Jesus' name we pray.